Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I will be speaking on the topic of when our prayers are not answered. So I'll speak this broadly in three parts. And after each part, we'll have some reflections. So if any point spoke to you, you can share that. And then in the end, we'll have question answers. So I'll, so I'll divide this in three broad parts. First is that God is not just a means to an end, God is himself an end. The second point is that God's plan is different from ours. We look at the present and plan the future. God looks at the future and plans the present. And the third point is don't let expectation of a fulfilled prayer block us from the power of connection with God. So let's begin. The first point is that God is not just a, a means to an end, but rather he is himself an end, his ultimate end. There are two broad conceptions of religion. There is material religion and spiritual religion. Material religion means that the idea is that this world is the most important thing in the world, is in existence. And all of reality centers around this world. And God, if he exists, is a tool to help us make our life happier in this world. So, material religion means religion is a tool to material things. And this is the idea of religion which most people have. And based on this, when we approach God, often the prayer becomes a tool for, for lack of a better word, manipulation. Mm. Once a person took a lottery and with that lottery, he, it was one million dollar lottery and he went to God and he said, oh God, if I win this lottery, I will give you 50 percent. Mm -hmm. And he waited, the little result came after, uh, after one week and when he went and saw the result, he had won the prize. And he was delighted and then he noticed that actually he had won the second prize. The first prize was one million dollars, the second prize was how much? Half of that, half a million dollars. So he looked at it, thought about it and he went to God and he said, oh God, you are so clever, you took your share before only. <laughs> so the idea is here that God, when we pray to God, the idea is that we use God to get certain things. Once there were three religions, we were always quarreling and conflicting with each other. So all three followers of the three religions went to God and they prayed. So followers of religion, they prayed, Oh God, please destroy the followers of religion B. The followers of religion B went and prayed, Oh God, please destroy the followers of religion A. The followers of religion C went and said, Oh God, I don't want anything for myself. Just fulfill the prayers of the followers of religion A and B. <laughs> so the idea here is what? That prayer in material religion is often a tool for getting God to do the things that we want, but we can't. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not a bad thing, at least we are approaching God. And Krishna says that those who approach God like this, they are also Sukritina, Chatur Vidha Vajante Maam, Janaha Sukritina Arjuna, Arto Jignasur Artharthi, Yani Chibhartar Shiva. 
So those who want some well, those who want some relief from distress. Krishna said they are sukruti na. In the, sixth, in the seventh chapter, sixteenth verse, he says they are also pious people. However, when they evolve, this is sixteenth verse in the seventh chapter, then seventeenth, eighteenth, and nineteenth verse. Three verses later, Krishna talks about their evolution. And when they evolve, what happens? Bahunam janmana mante gyanavan mam prapadyate vasudeva sarvamiti samahatma sudurlabha. So after many lifetimes of spiritual evolution, Bahunam Janmana Mante, they become Gyanavan. They become full of knowledge. And when they become full of knowledge, Gyanavan, we have the word Dhanavan. Does anyone know what Dhanavan means? Sorry? Yes, Dhanavan. Van is possessor. So Dhan, one who possesses wealth. So Gyanavan means one who is the Rich with knowledge, one who possesses knowledge. So, Gyanavan, when they become knowledgeable, what happens? Maam prapadyate, they surrender to me. What is with what understanding? Vasudeva sarvamiti. Vasudeva sarvamiti. That God, Krishna, Vasudeva, He is everything. And those who understand this, Samahatma sudurlabha, they are very rare. They are not ordinary people. So, now this understanding, what does it mean? We say, there are so many attractive things in this world. Hmm? Uh, there is wealth, there is power, there is prestige, there are positions, there are so many enjoyments. So what does it mean Vasudeva Sarvamiti? Do all these things not exist? No, they all exist. And they all have some capacity to provide us enjoyment. And not just providing enjoyment, many of the things in life we need for our very existence. But what the Bhagavad Gita tells us is that Everything attractive in this world comes from God. It is sustained by God. It manifests a spark of God's attractiveness. In 10.41, the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, Yad yad vibhuti mat sattvam, shri madur jitame vava, tatta deva vagachatvam, mamate jomsha sambhava. That everything attractive its attractiveness is like a spark and God is like the sun so everything attractive it is attractive no doubt about it but its attractiveness is very small other example we could use is say of an ocean and in the ocean there is a beach and then away from the beach as we move there is a desert and we are somewhere here some, some distance from the ocean and now there are drops of water sprinkled everywhere. Some drops, let's say the ocean is here, we are here. Some drops of water are here itself. If we pursue those drops of water, we will just stay equidistant from the ocean. There are some drops of water just sprinkled over here. If we pursue those drops of water, we will actually die of thirst eventually. Because that will take us away from the reservoir of water, the oasis. The ocean, and this is the oasis also. So, but there are some drops of water which take us towards the ocean and the oasis. So now, everything attractive comes from God, but everything attractive doesn't take us to God. So, so now, everything attractive, it is important, it can give us pleasure, it can give us shelter, but whatever it can give us is like a drop. Whereas what God himself is, is like the oasis, the vast oasis, a reservoir of water. So spiritual religion means understanding that our real world life is at the spiritual level. That we are meant to connect with God. And therein, in love for Him is life's supreme satisfaction. So He is all attractive. He is eternal. And we are also eternal. So when the eternal soul, we as souls are eternal, as the body, we will all have to die. But when the eternal soul connects with the eternal whole, then there is eternal love. And that eternal love is life's ultimate purpose. We are all on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. Spiritual evolution means the evolution of our spiritual understanding. A child thinks that the most important thing in the world is a toy or a game. 
Even before that, the child, uh, infant thinks that the most important thing in the world is if I am crying, somebody will come and pacify me. So, but as the child grows up, what happens? The child understands, yes, toys are important, but there are many more important things in life also. So similarly, now the toy has the capacity to give pleasure. But how much? And how long? Little pleasure for a short time. As the child grows up into adult, he well understands. There are so many more important things to do in life. I can have a career, I can, have a, I can make some fulfilling contributions, I can have a family, I can take care of others. I can do so much more in life than playing with a toy. So just as a child grows up, and the child's conception of what is important evolves. Similarly, as we grow spiritually, our conception of what is important evolves. So spiritual evolution is essentially the evolution in our understanding of what is truly important. And as that understanding grows, we recognize the things of the world are important, but ultimately how much and how long so they are being captivated by them is like staying in a childish state spiritually but when you grow up we mature then we understand krishna is life's ultimate purpose whatever i may get by anything in this world i'll get it all through krishna if i connect with him i'll get everything that i need through him and therefore Vasudeva Sarvamiti. As a famous prayer, Tomeva Mata Chapita Tomeva, Tomeva Bandusha Sakha Tomeva, Tomeva Vidya Dravinam Tomeva, Tomeva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva. He says, You are my mother, you are my father, you are my bro brother, you are my friend, you are my knowledge, you are my wealth, you, O oh Lord, are my everything. So the idea is, it's not literal that God is the mother or God is the father. That whatever love we get from the mother, whatever love we get from the father, whatever affection we get from our brothers or sisters or friends, whatever shelter, whatever position we get by our wealth, by our knowledge, all that ultimately is coming from God. It is God who is giving us all these. Whatever, whoever gives to us, it is God who is giving us. And therefore, Tomeva Sarvam Mama Deva Deva. You, my O oh Lord, my are my everything. So, if we want to relate with God with the conception of material religion, then we think, okay, I'll go to God, I'll pray for this, and if I get it, yes, God is good, God exists, God cares. And if my God does not give what I want, then maybe God doesn't exist or maybe God doesn't uh, care or maybe God is bad. So God is non-existent, God is irrelevant or God is malevolent. So for most people today, God is, they consider it irrelevant. Okay, maybe God exists. So what? Because they feel, okay, I can work and I can fulfill whatever I want to get, my desires. But as long as we are at the level of material religion, we will find that our connection with God will stay very unstable. Whereas, if we evolve to the spiritual level, that is when our conception will evolve and expand enough to understand how God is answering our prayers, even when he seems to be not answering them. So that is the first point, that God is not just an, a means to an end, He is the ultimate end Himself. So any comments about this? Any thoughts? Any reflections? Anything that struck you? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, am I worshipping the wrong God? Oh, that assumes there is a true right God and a wrong God also. <laughs> different religions, different religions. 
yeah maybe i have to worship through some other path yeah it happens in india sometimes there are a lot of uh, christian missionaries who try to convert indians so what they do is that in their hospitals not all christians some people in their hospitals they give people just uh, some water as an injection they give some sugar pills as medicine and people are not treated they become sicker and sicker and then they say you know actually this disease is not so easily curable you pray to your god they pray to their god and still what happens they continue give the same medicine not it is not a medicine and they keep getting worse actually you are going to die now you pray to your god and help you so you pray to our god and when they pray to their god when they pray to jesus then they give the actual medicine when they give the actual medicine people get cured and they get cured oh just see our god saved your life our god is the true god your god is the false god now you should give your life to god so that's how they sometimes try to convert so that idea is false god true god can also be there yeah thank you any other comments yes please Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Sometimes we become we think of something as more important than what it is the nature of the mind is that once it starts believing that something is enjoyable it stops examining whether it is actually enjoyable or whether it is even actually essential just like a child sometimes becomes adamant i want this toy i want this toy i want this toy and the parents may labor a lot to get that toy and if they don't get the toy what happens the child says children at their level are very expert the child parents don't give the toy you don't love me only so the parents may be doing 100 things for the child but the one thing is not done you don't love me and when the parents do give the toy what happens they take the toy play it for some time then put it aside so sometimes we also become like that that we become too hooked to expecting one thing to be done and we don't really evaluate how essential is it for me do i really need it is it really all that enjoyable that i think it is so if we can let go of our ego then we can we can actually move forward in life and find that maybe better things are awaiting us thank you so that leads us to the second point which i'm going to make second point is that god's plan works differently from ours we see the present and plan the future there is god sees the future and plans the present now what this means is that both god and us we are working for the same purpose god also wants us to be happy we also want to be happy god wants us to uh, god wants us to ultimately have auspiciousness in our life that's what we also want but often our vision is short term whereas his vision is much more long term suppose there is a <coughs> patient who is sick and if somebody is sick and in pain at that time the doctors usually give two medic forms of medication is an analgesic and is antiseptic the analgesic helps in dealing with pain is that right we have a doctor here with us you can correct me if i am wrong so there is a pain medication analgesic and then there is a actual cure now what happens is from the patient's perspective you take the antiseptic it may take some time to work the analgesic immediately it works so now from the patient's perspective the patient may not even understand what disease i have the patient perceives the disease primarily in the form of the pain and if something gives relief from the pain it's good 
and that is what the patient wants. Patient wants relief from the pain and the pain medication does give that. But sometimes the patient may become so short sighted, the patient may start thinking actually this pain medication is so cheap, this analgesic as antiseptic is so expensive, why do I need to spend so much money on the antiseptic? I will just take the analgesic and I am free from pain. Now the doctor will give both the analgesic and the antiseptic. But if the patient stops taking the antiseptic, see what happens? Then, although the pain may be going away temporarily, but the pain is not being cured, it is being covered. And at such times, sometimes the doctor may say, don't take the analgesic. In fact, the doctor may take, if the patient is in hospital, doctor may take all the analgesics away. The patient says, no, I am in pain, give me this. He says, no, take this. No, I don't want that. Just give me this. He says, no, take this. No. Now, both the patient and the doctor want the patient to be healthy. But what is happening? The patient is looking at the present and planning the future. I have pain right now. I pop this pill. My pain goes away. The doctor is looking at the future and planning the present. Right now, the do this patient has a serious disease. And in the future, it can even become fatal. So the antiseptic has to be taken right now. So sometimes, the analgesic may be withdrawn by the doctor so that the patient focuses on the antiseptic. Okay, this is what you have to take. No, 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 I want this. No, you are not going to get this. Take this. There is nothing. The patient may take it at that time. So, God's plan and our plan ultimately are for the same purpose. But sometimes they appear to work at cross purpose. They appear, they are not actually working at cross purpose. Now, what is an analgesic and what is an antiseptic for us? We are all souls, and in this world, we have various material needs and material desires. At a very basic level, we need food, clothing, shelter. We need nowadays heat, light, electricity, internet. <laughs> These are also have come to the level of necessities now. <laughs> they are not luxuries, they are necessities. But whatever it is, we have all these needs. And <clears throat> for us, if these are not there, it causes great pain to us. If we are thirsty and there is no water, it causes great pain. If you are hungry and there is no food. Once I was travelling from uh, India from one corner to the other corner, Calcutta to Mumbai. And in between there was a big flood. So, it was like a, it was a 20 hour travel. But it because of the flood, the train got, went to another path and it became a 73 hour travel. And we just in the train for 73 hours. And uh, we, we had not packed, we had just packed food for one day. And we didn't have any food over there. And somehow, because of the flood and everything, whichever station the train would stop, there were, there were no fruits available over there. So, no fruit. Normally, we, we take food which is cooked and offered to Krishna. So, there is just no food available at all. And thinking what to take, maybe there are some groundnuts available somewhere. So, that was the time actually we discovered the power of groundnuts. So, we just took some groundnuts and groundnuts give a lot of nourishment. All the nourishment is groundnuts are so small. You take it. Just see beyond the smallness and actually take it. That's given a good, good amount of strength. The peanuts, basically. But anyway, so when the food is not available, at that time it causes great agitation, and it is required. But if you look at it, after we get food, what happens? The absence of food causes pain, but the availability of food doesn't really bring much positive joy. Unless the food is a desert or a great delicacy, okay, I eat the food and what next now? So, food is required, but it is like a painkiller. It is like the analgesic. It is like required. Its absence causes pain, but its presence does not solve any ultimate problem. There is what we live with and what we live for. If you are driving a car and if you run out of fuel, it is a big problem. We need to get the fuel for the car. 
But suppose somebody is driving, we ask them, where are you going? I'm going to fuel my car. Okay, after that? No, then I'll go to the next gas station to fuel my car. After that? No, next gas station. No, but where are you going? I'm just going to gas station to fuel my car. But what after that? No, that's what I'm doing with my, with my car. No, that's not what car is meant for. That is what we drive with and what we drive for. We drive with the car and the car requires fuel. But we drive for some purpose, to go to meet someone, to go to work, go to college, for some purpose. Now what we, what we live with is important. But what we live for is even more important. So what we live with are the things of the world. It can be food, clothing, shelter, money, money, some social position, some in today's world some comforts and facilities. They are all required. But they are what we live with. But what do we live for? What is it that we are ultimately pursuing through all this? So if this, is what, if this is what we live for, then all this is temporary. The wealth that we have today, it's not going to be there with us after we die. Even the knowledge that we have, the learning that we have, very little of it is going to carry over with us. So, these things, they are like analgesics. For us, for us to be treated, what is our, what is the root cause of our dissatisfaction is that we are in material consciousness. We are disconnected from God. God, as I said, Krishna is all attractive. Krishna is eternal. And love for him leads to absorption in him and that leads to the supreme satisfaction. So that is life's ultimate purpose. That is what we are meant to live for. And Krishna pushes us in various ways towards that. Krishna pushes us in various ways to focus on Him, to devote ourselves to Him and to become absorbed lovingly in Him. And while we are doing that, Krishna also provides us the things of the world. Just like a doctor gives both the antiseptic and the analgesic. Similarly, Krishna gives us material needs also of life. But Krishna's primary purpose is our spiritual growth. And sometimes if we get too infatuated with something material, and we think this is what my life is meant for. This is what I want. Without this, my life is useless. Then, that's like a patient focusing only on the analgesic and neglecting the antiseptic. And the doctor may stop it. So like that sometimes Krishna may take away or withhold something which we think is very important temporarily. And we pray for it, we beg for it and it doesn't come. And then we feel, why? Doesn't God answer my prayers? Actually, God does answer our prayers but God is himself the ultimate answer to our prayers. That ultimately what we need is God. Krishna is Krishna's greatest blessing. So when our prayers are not being answered, rather than obsessing, why is this not happening? Why is this not happening? Why is this not happening? We focus on uh, connecting ourselves with Krishna. We focus on growing spiritually. On growing spiritually. You know, when I was about one, at that time, uh, my parents gave me a, <coughs> at that time, I was in India in a remote place, so there was the fear of polio over there. So my parents gave me the, to be to doctor and gave me the polio vaccine. And then I came back and the next day, I don't remember this, my parents told me all this afterwards, that <coughs> I was just walking and suddenly I collapsed. And I just couldn't walk again. My parents were alarmed, they rushed me to the doctor. And later they found out that the doctor had made a mess with the vaccine. He had not kept it in proper refrigeration. And that vaccine's quantity had become too much. So the vaccine, instead of protecting me from polio, ended up giving me polio. And then my parents were shattered by that. And then they were, my, as I grew up, my mother would tell me that every day I pray to God, let your leg be healed. And they tried many, many different treatments. Now, this doctor, that doctor, 
ट्रेडिशनल आई मीन एलोपैथिक मेडिसिन आयुर्वेदिक मेडिसिन मसाज थेरेपी दिस दैट सो मेनी थिंग्स दे ट्राई एंड सम हाउ समथिंग समाइम लाइक इंप्रूव एंड अगेन इट रिग्रेस अगेन इट इंप्रूव अगेन इट रिग्रेस नथिंग हैपन देन इवेंचुअली दैट सम हाउ बिकॉज आई वॉज नॉट फिजिकली वेरी एक्टिव आई बिकेम इंटेलेक्चुअली क्वाइट एक्टिव to read a lot i love to read i love to study and even when my 10th standard exam i came the first in in a particular category in the whole state of maharashtra which has like several crore people mm-hmm. and at that time the the head of the whole district uh, came to our house to felicitate me and my parents were there and at that time my mother told me afterwards that now i understand how god fulfilled my prayer he said that what god took away in physical ability he gave you in intellectual ability if you had been physically very active you would never have focused on studies like this so at that time you know krishna sees the future and plans the present so she all these years she thought that why is god not answering my prayers but god answered her prayers in a different way so of course she always took very great care of me and she never ever made me feel that i was deficient because of lacking uh, lacking a proper mobility or whatever but the important thing is that sometimes it may take several years for us to understand what god's plan is in nature we see that god breaks things to make them better if we see clouds in the sky often look beautiful they can be different there is a whole hobby of cloud watching now they are this cloud is of this kind this cloud is of this kind this cloud of this kind so now clouds are beautiful but clouds have to be broken so that rains can come through there and the, the clouds are beautiful but rains are what sustain life on the earth if we only had beautiful clouds with no rains we would die when the rains come then they uh, nourish the soil but for the soil to give vegetation the soil has to be broken it has to be plowed especially if you want to cultivate irrigate get grains then grains when we get them the grains need to be broken to be made into edible food stuffs then the edible food stuff when we eat it you know when we have food in a plate sometimes when i travel uh, to different places devotee sometimes make such so many items i sometimes i tell that you know, actually this is so beautiful i feel bad about disturbing it by eating it <laughs> it's so artistically decorated so now the food will be very looking very attractively artistically decorated but you know, we have to eat it it so the food may look very attractive now when the food converts it converts into energy we don't see it at all so the f- attractive looking food has to be broken down so that it can be converted into usable energy so similarly for us sometimes what may be our plan may need to be broken so that a better plan may emerge that's why if you understand this point that god and us are not at god is not at cross purposes with us it is not that we want something and god is withholding us from us ultimately what we want and god wants is the same thing so uh, <coughs> god's plan is more long term and with this understanding we can sometimes if our prayer is not answered not become disheartened or alienated from god by that we see that our plan is short term whereas god's plan is long term we see the present and plan the future god sees the future and plans the present so this was the second point any reflections about this okay so i'll move on to the third point the third point is that while we are waiting for god's plan to manifest now focus on connection not on expectation 
What does this mean? That means they, we have a particular issue, say somebody is not getting a job, somebody is having a sickness and that sickness is not getting healed. Somebody wants having some turbulence in a relationship, they want a relationship to stabilize, somebody wants to form a relationship and they are not finding an appropriate person. There are so many things which we want in our lives and we may be even praying for it and we are not getting it. So at that time, when, even when we come to God, we become very expectation conscious. Very expectation consciousness means that even when we come to a temple, we pray to God. We are not conscious so much of God as of whether He is fulfilling our expectation or not. And then when we become too expectation conscious, then if that as long as that expectation is not fulfilled, we feel as if our prayer, our religion, all our practices are simply a waste of time. But even during that time, actually just the connection with God can give us strength, it can give us satisfaction. In the Bhagavad, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prahlad Maharaj says that there are nine processes of devotional service. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Pada, Sevanam, Archanam, Bandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atma, Nivedanam, Iti, Pumsar, Pita, Vishnu, Bhaktish, Chena, Navalakshana, Kriyeta, Bhagavat, Yadda, Tanmanye, Dita, Muttamam. She says that <coughs> Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, hearing about Krishna, speaking about Krishna, Remembering Krishna, praying to Krishna, worshipping Krishna. Praying is more of offering our prayers, worshipping is doing deity worship. Then serving his lotus feet, offering ourselves to him like this and carrying out his instructions. These are all ways in which create the Bhagavatya. These are all ways in which we express our devotion. So now it's interesting the way prayer is positioned over here. The way prayer is positioned here is that what is happening is Krishna is saying Shravanam, Kirtanam, when we hear about Krishna, when we speak about Krishna. Now, what is the purpose of hearing about Krishna or speaking about Krishna? Say, now you have come for this satsang program. Now, the purpose of this, at participating in this program is what? Connection with Krishna. You want to understand Krishna better. You want to know more about him so that you can connect with him better. If you want to love someone, you want to devote ourselves to someone, you want to know about that person. So just as hearing and chanting are meant for connecting with Krishna, in bhakti, even praying is meant for connecting with Krishna. So the purpose of prayer is not so much the fulfillment of prayer, the purpose of prayer is connection with Krishna. So a simple example to illustrate this point. Let's suppose we are burdened by some very big problem and something has gone terribly wrong in our life and it's a heavy burden on our head. And then if we just get somebody to talk with him, somebody just hears us non-judgmentally, just empathically they hear us out. Now they may have no power to solve our problems, but if they just hear us out, what happens? We feel unburdened we feel a little light. In fact, many people go to psychologists not because they have, they have, they have like serious mental health problems. Some people may have. But many people go to psychologists just because they want someone to hear them. Speak it. I want to hear. Just hear. So, when somebody just hears us out, that itself unburdens us. Even if that problem is immediately not solved. And not only do we feel lighter, but also we feel closer to that person. Oh, you, you give me your time, you heard me out. So similarly, if we are burdened by something, then if we just pray to Krishna, even with the, see, sometimes we go to some people, we expect a solution to the problem. And with some people we know, I can't get any solution because this is not even in their problem, power to solve. But they just hear us out, we understand that, yes, this, that they have helped me. 
So what happens is a child, and his child may cry and say, I want this toy. And the parents may struggle and give that toy. The child, if you see how the relationship between the child, I talked about evolution earlier, and the, how the relationship between the child and the parent evolves. When the, when the, when the child is an infant, see, in every relationship normally there is some expectation and there is some contribution. We want someone to do something for us and we do something for the other person. So now, when a, when a child is an infant, actually there is no contribution, only expectation. When a child cries and expects the world to come running to pacify the child. But as the child starts growing, the child starts understanding that actually I can't just have expectations. Maybe I should keep my part of the room clean, I should, uh, I should do this, I should do that. And the child starts growing more and more. Maybe let me do some, assist something in the home work. Then as the child grows up, okay, let me take some financial responsibility, take care of the home. So what happens as the child grows, the expectation goes down, the contribution increases. Now, as the child also grows, the child also understands that my parents are limited. So, the child may say, I want this toy and the parents may give that toy. But the child goes and says that, uh, I want this or I want that. Say the child gets, infa say the young boy or young girl gets infatuated with some partner. They say, I want this person. And that person is not really interested, the parents can't force. So, the child understands that, you know, my parents are limited, they can't fulfill certain things. That is also one reason why the expectations go down. But as the relationship evolves, what happens is the contribution increases. Now with respect to Krishna, often what happens is, as we grow, we, we normally there is contribution, there is expectation. But when we come to Krishna, we think Krishna is unlimited. So instead of our contribution increasing, we think our expectation becomes unlimited. Now, if you want, you can do anything. Why are you not doing it? So, if you are not doing it, that means you don't care for me. So, when we are expectation conscious, then the strength that comes from connection, the peace that comes from connection, the, the sanctification, the inner sanctity that comes from connection, we miss it all out. So, if we just come to Krishna and pray to him, just chant his holy names, participate in his kirtans, hear his katha and just put aside whatever it is that we feel we need very strongly and just connect with Krishna. In that connection itself, we will gain strength, satisfaction, solace and by that we will find it okay, things are not as bad as I felt they were. Yes, there is a problem and I need to deal with it. But they are not as bad. What happens every time that there is, a, there is a real problem and there is the mind's exaggeration of the problem. So what happens? The problem may be this big, but the mind's exaggeration makes it be this big. This big problem we can deal with. But the mind's exaggerated version of the problem, nobody can deal with. So what happens when we come to Krishna? If we are still hooked to the mind's exaggerated version of the problem, feel I can't live. What is the use of this chanting? What is the use of this praying? What is the use of all this unless this problem is solved? Oh, so, but you can just put aside the mind's exaggerated version and try to focus on Krishna. The problem is there, it has to be dealt with. But if the mind's exaggerated version stops burning us, stops tormenting us, find okay this problem is there but it is livable I can live with it and that relief from the mind is exaggeration about the problem say sometimes say if it's very hot now you know it's very hot now last few days so when it is very hot say some people they can do nothing except talk about the weather it's so hot, it's so hot, it's so hot, it's so hot. And after some time, the weather is not as annoying as that people, this person complained about the weather. Come on now, okay, live with it. What can you do about it? So, so our mind is like that. There is a problem, but the mind keeps complaining about the problem so much that the mind is complaining about the problem becomes a bigger problem than the problem itself. 
but when we turn towards krishna and connect with him see as long as we have that expectation that means we are hearing the minds complaining and thinking krishna why not solving this why not solving this why not solving this but if we just put aside the mind and focus on connecting with krishna we will get calmness we will get strength we will get shelter over there itself and by that once we become we get calmness we get clarity we will be able to better deal with the problem if there is a constructive way to solve it we will move forward to solve it if we are tolerated we will get the forbearance to tolerate it and by krishna's grace by krishna's plan a problem that may seem huge right now we just go away in a few minutes so rather than catastrophizing the problems oh this is just so terrible what do i do with it why is krishna not dealing with it just focus on the connection with krishna and with that connection with krishna will find that even with the problem we will be able to deal we will be able to go on so i'll conclude with the last point if there is release from problems and there is relief amidst problems so often when we pray to krishna with a particular expectation that expectation is release from the problem <coughs> now krishna can and will do that also in future but if we focus on connection with krishna then we can get relief amidst the problem also we can get relief amidst the problem also it's like say outside it's very hot and we come to a nice air conditioned room we feel relief like that our mind is thinking about this problem that problem what if this happens what if that happens what if that happens what if that happens just focus on krishna getting us getting our consciousness focused on krishna is like coming to the air conditioned room we will feel relief we will feel relief we will get comfort and then even if we have to go out in the heat again will be rejuvenated will be pacified we can go out in the heat and deal with it but often what we do is we come to the air conditioned room we open the door and stand at the door and peek inside and then peek outside hey here it is cool has it become cool there hey it's become cool here has it become cool there and by that what happens instead of we experiencing relief even the air conditioned room starts becoming hot so like that we come to krishna but instead of being conscious of krishna we stay conscious of the problem and so the mind keeps saying this problem is so big this problem is so big this problem is so big so instead of hearing the mind tell us how big the problem is we can turn around and tell the mind how big krishna is and if we do that if we turn towards krishna and focus on the, uh, turn towards krishna and then turn towards the mind yes krishna is bigger than this krishna can give me shelter in this then even if we don't get the release from the problem we will get relief from it the problem and that will give us a realization that krishna is our supreme strength and eventually when the problem goes away we will find that that krishna's presence in our life our realization of krishna's presence in our life our realization of krishna's giving us capacity to give us shelter that will be our greatest gain that is what will stand us instead good stead throughout whatever life may send our way and that is what will take us ultimately to krishna and attaining krishna in his eternal abode is the ultimate fulfillment of all prayers so when krishna doesn't seem to be answering one prayer we can focus on connecting with krishna in that connection itself is the answer to the prayer and ultimately krishna will answer us by his our prayers in his way for our ultimate good so i'll summarize what i spoke and then if any questions we can discuss i spoke on this theme of when our prayers seem unanswered what do we do at that time so i spoke three points do you remember the first point Yes please Krishna is the end not the means Yes Krishna is not just the means to an end he is the ultimate he can be a means also but he is the ultimate end So whatever we think we need attract to things in this world 
they all are like drops of water where Krishna is like the oasis. So whatever we may get by all these things, we will get it all and more through Krishna. So material religion means we, we focus on getting the drops from Krishna. Spiritual religion means we focus on getting to the oasis. And if we grow from material religion to spiritual religion, then we will be able to better appreciate how Krishna is answering our prayers. Thank you. What is the second point? Anyone remember? Yes? Yes. We Yes, we look at the present and plan for the future. Krishna looks at the future and plans the present. So the example I gave for this was a patient and a doctor. The patient is looking only for pain relief. And the patient simply wants the analgesic. The doctor wants to cure the patient. The doctor focuses on the antiseptic. So both of them are ultimately working for the same purpose. So for us, all the things that we consider materially essential, they are like analgesics. Getting, not getting them causes pain, but getting them, okay, what next in life? So what we live with is different from what we live for. For a car, fuel is essential, but what are we, where are we driving with the car? So our material needs are like the fuel for the car, needed. But what, what is the bigger purpose in life? That bigger purpose is spiritual evolution. It's like a child evolves, she thinks toys are important, but as grows, understands that there are many more important things in life. Like that, initially we think material things are all important, but as we grow, we understand that actually it is Krishna who is most important. So, sometimes Krishna may withhold the analgesic from us so that we focus on the antiseptic. May take away something material or not give us something material so that we wholeheartedly focus on him. So, Krishna is not just when Krishna doesn't seem to be answering our prayers, Krishna himself may be the answer to our prayers. Yes. What are the last point? Yes, focus on connecting with Krishna, not expecting from Krishna. So, sometimes when we very strongly feel we need something and we don't get it, then we just become disconnected or alienated from Krishna. So, if we are burdened and somebody just hears us out, then we feel lighter and we feel closer to that person. So similarly, if we have problems, rather just pour out your heart to Krishna. Just pray to Krishna, not so much for the solution of the problem, just pray to Krishna, connect with him. And we'll feel lighter, we'll feel closer to Krishna. And normally, in any relationship as it grows, from a child to grow adulthood, the expectation decreases, the contribution increases. But with Krishna, because we think he is unlimited, our expectation also becomes unlimited. But Krishna has his own plans. And if we focus on connecting with him, then it's like outside it's hot, we come to air-conditioned room, we get relief. So instead of, the expectation means we are looking for release from the problems. But connection will give us relief amidst the problems and that relief will give us the conviction that Krishna is for real. Remembrance of Krishna really gives me strength and satisfaction and that conviction, that realization will stand as in good stead lifelong no matter what life sends our way and ultimately that realization will lead to absorption in Krishna and take us to him ultimately. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So any questions or comments? Yes, please. Would that be better? So the doctor just removed the pain and didn't cure. The pain is caused because of the disease. So we can't, the pain can't be removed without curing the disease. So we often feel our dissatisfaction is because of, oh, I'm not getting this, I'm not getting that, I'm not getting that. That's true. 
then sometimes dissatisfaction comes. See the unhappiness, uh, 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 yeah, the dissatisfaction, the pain of not of having unfulfilled desires is great. It is, is painful, but actually it is far more disorienting to have our desires fulfilled and realize they do not fulfill us. To have our desires fulfilled and realize they do not fulfill us. That is far more disorienting because then we wonder what am I next to do in my life. Somebody works very hard to achieve something and they achieve it and afterward they find it is an anticlimax. What text? When I was growing up because I was quite study oriented my dream was I wanted to come first in my class and I was always among the first but I was never the first. So, when I gave my GRE exam for going to America. So, at that time out of 2400 I got 2350. So, I was not just first in my college, I was first in the history of my college, I was first in the whole state of Maharashtra. So, I was so happy, I was jubilant for some time and then after that I realized just looking at the mark sheet does not give any happiness. What next? I want somebody to come and congratulate me, appreciate me and then many of my friends appreciate me, congratulate me, but somehow it happened that because it was so well known that everybody knew about it, my whole college knew about it. So, three of my friends one after another after another just forgot to congratulate me. And first time it happened I was annoyed, second time it happened I was angered, third time it happened I was infuriated, but still it is embarrassing you can't ask why are you not congratulating me. <laughs> But at that time when I was just infuriated, it just struck me, I sort of sometimes it happens in my life that in a sort of out of body experience not literally but conceptually, I look at myself from above and it struck me hey wait a minute, you thought that by becoming a topper, by becoming number one in your class you will become happy, but here instead of becoming happy you have become more dependent for your happiness on others. So, where is the happiness? So, actually that was very disorienting fortunately for that time soon after that I was introduced by a devotee by a devotee to Krishna and Bhagavad Gita or you could say reintroduced I knew I was in childhood but I had neglected. So, and that is how it gave me some orientation, but people who have some desires fulfilled and they do not know what to do next. So, that is very disorienting. So, it is like you deal with the pain without curing the disease, but it does not work. The emptiness remains. So, when we have a particular material goal which you want to fulfill, that is like I want to get rid of this pain. I get rid of the pain, but still the emptiness remains. The there is a it said that there is a there is a hole in our heart. And that hole in the heart can be filled only by God. It is a God shaped hole in the heart. And we try to fill, we can put in a million other things in that hole, but uh, that hole will not be filled. It's only when we put God there, that hole will be filled. Okay. The cure cannot be got without connecting with God. Otherwise, there is no other cure. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, good question. So, is can't our full if our desire is fulfilled, won't that lead to an won't that be an impetus for us to move towards God? Yes, and that is why God does fulfill desires. See, if you see, there is a beautiful prayer by Kulashekhar Maharaj in his uh, Mukundamala Sotra. Lokasya Vesanapanodankaro Dasyasakim Nakshamaha. 
Lokasya Vesana Apanodan Karo. He says, at O Lord, you remove the distresses of people in general. Then why would you not remove the distress of one who has dedicated their life to you? Tasya Kim Nakshamaha. So the point I'm making is, millions of people go to temples, churches, mosques, gurudwaras, and so many places like that. Now, are all of them at the level of spiritual religion? No. Most of them are at the level of material religion. And they are getting something. That's why they are going to, the, going to the temple, the mosque, the church. So, approaching God for fulfilling our material desires, also for fulfilling what we feel we need right now, also works. If it were not working, nowadays there is no pressure on people. In the past, maybe there is you had to look good in people's eyes and that's why you had to go to religious places. But now there is not no kind of no pressure like that in society. But still people are going. So, why is that? Because even religion at the material level works. We pray to God and what we want, what we need, we do get it. But not always. Not always. So now, <clears throat> it's a it's a part of parenting that the, if the parents give every single thing that the child demands, then the child becomes spoiled, child becomes pampered. And sometimes the parents may withhold something from the child. And so like that, sometimes Krishna may not fulfill some of our desires. And that's why it's, it's very helpful for us, before asking for our blessings, we should be counting our blessings. Because what happens, uh, whenever we are, whenever we are in a particular situation in life, what we have, we take it for granted already. And what we don't have, that's what we obsess over. But if we learn, if we start counting our blessings, we see there is so much right in our life. Now, if we are just breathing right now, that means there is more right than wrong in our lives. <laughs> So many people who die, most of us are probably 30, 40 or something like that. So many millions of people die before that age. So the very fact that we are alive means a lot has gone right in our lives. We could be dead right now. So actually, it's like we need to consciously direct our attention towards what is right. And there are so many things right in our lives. We, uh, we have basic health, we have a good friend social circle, we may have some career, we may have some uh, social security, so many things we have. If you start counting them, if you start looking even from a material perspective, how many people are less endowed than us? And we'll find there are so many. For most of us, we would say that we are probably the 60 to maybe 60 to 80 percent of the world's population would be less materially endowed than us. So there is a lot right in our life even at the material level. So <clears throat> sometimes our prayers are not answered, then that doesn't necessarily mean that God doesn't care for us. And sometimes it may happen that the answering of that prayer <clears throat> may actually lead to greater infatuation with that particular material thing and that may take us away from God. We don't know at this stage. So from our perspective it may seem that yeah, this prayer is fulfilled by faith in God will increase. But it may or it may not. Because how our mind will work, how our mind will work in the presence of certain things, in the absence of certain things, it's all very unpredictable. If somebody doesn't have much wealth and they pray, Oh God, I want money, I want, I, I, I want money, I want money. And then they get, a lot of, they get a job which gives them a lot of money. But then that job consumes them so much <coughs> that uh, they have no time for God. They don't have any time for even their family. And they may say, actually God fulfilled my prayer. Well, was that really a fulfillment of a prayer? They sought that, they got that. But by that they went away from what is truly important in life. So that's why <clears throat> now when we form a relationship with God, in 
material religion we set the terms of the relationship the terms of the relationship is god it's the term it's my intelligence and your power by my intelligence i know what i want and you use your power to give it to me that is the, the terms of material religion spiritual religion means so in material religion also we are trusting god that god has power and god's power is far greater than mine but somehow we think god's power is greater than mine but my intelligence is greater than his see everybody likes to serve god do you think so every even atheists like to serve god but only in one service as advisors as advisors you know atheists also say you know, hey, if god had existed he would not have made this like this he would not have made it like this so what happens is we when we in material religion we think our intelligence and god's power but spiritual religion means we understand god's power is greater than mine and god's intelligence is also greater than mine and therefore okay we can earnestly pray to krishna krishna this is what i feel is important this is what i want and there is it's not that we should think that this is a material desire why should how can i pray to krishna if if we feel it's important if it's affecting our spiritual life then what is the difference between material and spiritual it's ultimately affecting our consciousness which is the essence of spiritual life so we can pray to krishna krishna this is very important for me please let this work out we can pray like that but at the same time we don't make our devotion conditional to the fulfillment of that prayer hmm. uh, <coughs> in the in the bible towards the end jesus prays that you know, he comes to know that he is going to be betrayed and he is going to uh, be killed so at that time he prays oh father let the cup pass the idea is that at that time when somebody would be killed they would be given a cup of poison like socrates was done so but <coughs> jesus was found was found so guilty that he was crucified it's a particularly brutal form of killing but anyway so he says oh father let this cup pass and then he concludes but let thy will be done not mine so there is nothing wrong in expressing our desire our need our concern in fact doing that will connect us with krishna also but we don't reduce our relationship to krishna to the fulfillment of that particular desire okay if that is not fulfilled still krishna i am going to serve you okay thank you thank you very much shri prabhupada ki gaur bhakta vrinda ki jai gaur premanande Guru Vasha Karthi and then I'll finish the Prasad